Hey, this is Monica. And hey, hey, this is Melody. And, and welcome, welcome to the Invisible Women Podcast. Hello, IW listeners. We have with us today, as we continue to honor and celebrate Black Women's History Month, we have with us Robin Ruth Simmons, who is the founder of The First Repair. Hello, Robin. Hi, how are you, Melody and Monica? Very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Hey, Thank Robin. You. Thank you so much. We are so excited to have you here with us. Um, as Melody mentioned, uh, Robin is the founder of First Repair. And so um, for all of you that don't know, uh, Robin is one of the first to actually um, implement a reparations program that is happening and it's happening right now today. And so before we start off, you know, everybody knows about slavery. We all know about reparations, um, but you know, obviously um, when we talk about, you know, slaves that came over here, we have over 12.5 million Africans that came over here and were held captive in slavery. Um, we also know that, you know, slaves were sold between $250 and up. Um, and we know that slaves were not paid. And so free labor, free labor. So Robin, can you please tell our listeners how you gained interest in politics and specifically what motivated you um, to, to lead the Evanston Reparations, the nation's first government funding uh, legislation? Uh, well, what brought me into politics really was um, the discrimination in business and mm -hmm. in housing. Okay. And so before I was an elected official, I was an entrepreneur and I'm still an entrepreneur. I still maintain um, ownership of some residential and commercial real estate. But awesome. in that role, I saw the barriers to, um, you know, acquiring mortgages, you know, getting access to uh, properties. Um, in business, I saw the barriers to fair um, procurement opportunities through municipal governments. I just saw that, you know, lending was predatory. It was a long list of reasons why um, I wanted to be in elected office to change policy. And I ran okay. for elected office really focused on uh, the black inclusion, financial inclusion, or the black experience. And it wasn't until I was in office that it evolved to reparations. So two years in the office, my work evolved to reparations. It didn't start with reparations while I was elected official. Okay. So Robin, so you've seen the discrimination, you've seen obviously like the red lining, I think that's what it's called um, mm -hmm. in neighborhoods where they're only giving us loans for specific areas of cities. And then like, so what area did you notice it? Was it just your area in Evanston or was it all around in Chicago? What did that look like? Well, for me, my um, real estate career actually started in Michigan. As I mentioned, okay. I lived in Michigan for five years. So I was a real estate broker there. And I already knew, I already knew that there were challenges and barriers um, for black families. But while I worked as a real estate broker and later worked as a residential contractor, i learned even more so how systemic it was and how intentional it was, that it wasn't any issue of the black community. It was uh, intentional. Mm. And I realized that while I was in that role, and I later, uh, when I moved to my back to my home, um, which is Evanston, Illinois, I saw it all around. And so mm. Evanston um, is very diverse. We're known for our diversity. We are celebrated for our diversity, but we're still very much racially segregated. So there is a black section of town. Yeah. That black section of town, although redlining has been outlawed many years ago, um, is still disinvested in, has, you know, defer deteriorating housing stock, has inferior infrastructure. It has the least amount of access really to everything mm. um, because of anti-Blackness and anti-Black zoning laws more specifically. And so that's what led me to thinking about repair, not just for the institution of slavery and the crimes against humanity that we know slavery to be, but all of its legacies and vestiges, which include hyper-local policy like zoning laws and other anti-Black practices that happen in Evanston, Chicago, and all over the United States. Okay. Yeah, because I'm pretty familiar with uh, Illinois is one of the most segregated um, states. 
and a lot of people don't know that um but like you were stating you feel it right you know that these areas are predominantly for us only they're not given the same funding the same access they're not fixing up the streets like they do in other sides of towns um okay wow okay so i'm just trying to give our listeners a workup as to how you got this plan rolled out because again robin it's amazing you're the first person to do it and so we're just trying to figure out the blueprint and yeah i don't want to jump ahead but Robin also has a film, which is called The Big Payback, that I, uh, Melody and I watched this weekend. A really, really good film. Uh, if you really want to get to know Robin, I think that's a, a, a great uh, documentary to watch. Yeah, Melody, what are your thoughts on, on all of this? <laughs> well, Robin, thank you for the work that you've done. Monica and I both have roots in Michigan. Um, our mom and dad are from Muskegon, if you ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. And I was actually born in Grand Rapids, so thank you. Um, and, you know, the work that you're doing is definitely contributing to, you know, closing the racial wealth gap, right, which is real. And, um, you know, for, like Monica said, we watched The Big Payback. Uh, one of the questions that I have for you, because you would think, you know, doing this advocacy that most people would be on board. But there was a gentleman that was in your documentary that I noticed that had a lot of hesitation of not wanting right, the reparations. And just curious to know, do you find that a lot uh, within our community um, while you're, you know, trying to fight for the injustice? And how do you go about handling that? Well, I'll tell you that we don't find that often, but we absolutely do find that folks don't want reparations, don't want the forms of reparations that is being um, offered. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't say there's any right, right or wrong. I do, I have seen that the older generations um, have had more thoughts about um, not believing that white folks can do anything to repair the harm, that it's just too broad and vast and uh, nothing would be enough. Okay. Um, we've seen the position that, uh, you know, you can bootstrap it like our family did. Uh, we've seen the position that um, only cash or only education or only housing, different opinions about what forms of reparations. But there's no doubt that the majority of our communities want and demand reparations and expect it in a comprehensive way. Cash, housing, police reform, policy change, and so on. Um, so in that case, you know, it was it was understood. We have a community. We don't all agree on everything just because we're black. You know, we're not a monolith and we hear that all the time. And that's even more so the case in reparations. We all have opinions. Yeah, and I believe right. everybody's right. We should have cash, but I don't believe it is either or. We should also have housing. We should also have access to education and so on. Um, but we also should focus on self-determination. So bootstrapping okay. is something that I wouldn't call it bootstrapping, but we no doubt should be concerned about how we are earning, keeping our dollars, how we're circulating it within the community. What are we doing to, for self-determination and practices like cooperative economics? And are we shopping black and are we hiring black people from the community and so on? So the harm over 400 years is so great that it will take us doing all of these different activities and it will take our allies doing all that they should do as well. And so right. I don't get too um, uh, offended when folks disagree uh, with the approach that we're taking for reparations or even disagree with forms of reparations because I understand that we all have an opinion and then we all have personal life circumstances that might motivate us to need cash more, or we might have a life experience where we were housing insecure and um, a house, home ownership will give us more peace and security. So I get it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think you handled it well. Again, I watched the film, you were on a couple meetings and they were kind of beating you up and you took it like a champ. And that's what real leaders do. So I appreciate that. But I just want to talk really briefly. Uh, season one, it was either season one or season two. We had uh, Madam C.J. Walker's granddaughter on our podcast. Mm -hmm. And we started to talk a little bit about the black wealth um, theft. And so we talk about bootstrapping and 
and making our way and building things, but we do have it to where there were a lot of great things built and a lot of dollars circulating within communities and um, it was stolen, it was burned down. Um, and so, you know, things specifically people know about uh, Black Wall Street and there's other areas, there's even areas in LA, I think in Hawthorne that they put a whole beach there. And so yep. that was Black wealth um, that was considered stolen. And so when we talk about reparations, that's where the, the Black, well, gap comes into play because if our great, 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 great grandmothers weren't able to leave us something because it was burned down versus white people, they are, and that's what they're still living on, um, it, it uh, makes it really difficult to rebuild that. Um, and so I guess the question for you is how did you necessarily, and, and I know that you kind of have a course through your organization, but how do you start to calculate what people are owed in terms of reparations? Because you're right, the harm is so great. And even when you think about all the free labor, right? How do you even really calculate that? So where do where would one start? Well, when the reparations activity that's happening today is primarily um, municipal and more, uh, more often it's state-based. So okay. you can look at the incident and you could look at the economic loss at that time and use an economic model to project what the loss is. Now, an economist needs to do all of that. Yes. And that's very important when you're looking at uh, the racial wealth gap. But it's also understood that the racial wealth gap alone will not solve for the harm that we experience, the trauma that we experience as Black people, mm -hmm. the health conditions that we experience from being Black and not having access to health over time, not having access to healthy food. Even today, there are neighborhoods that have food deserts, probably in the Bay Area, certainly in the Chicagoland right. area, there are food right. deserts. There is. Um, policy reform. So even if we address the racial wealth gap and solve for it, we still have black, anti-blackness is baked into current policy, yep. uh, locally, at a state level, and also at a federal level. So we're really looking at a comprehensive way to repair the wealth gap alone is not sufficient for full repair. It is a first tangible step that I think we all agree on. But when you really look at how do we really return the dignity of a people, our land was stripped away, our culture, our language. You know, we weren't, we were kidnapped from West Africa, yep. tortured and enslaved and raped um, and traumatized in all different ways here in this nation. And we live with that trauma both experience it, experiencing it today through um, police terror and other ways, but we also have inherited a lot of that trauma through through our DNA. Um, and that's called transgenerational epigenetics. Um, you can learn more about that. There's a harm report on the Encobra's uh, website, which is the leading legacy organization for reparations. So. Okay. The wealth gap is one thing, and how do we calculate the harm is an economic model that there are genius economists, including um, our movement queen economist, uh, Dr. Julianne Malvo, maybe somebody you want to have on the show to learn more about economic models to calculate the damages. Uh, but those are ways that that can happen. And I just want to lift up, um, you're right, it was Bruce's Beach in California, Okay. But also there is a new movement for reparations in Palm Springs. It's being led by civil rights attorney Ariva Martin. And you may want to even yeah. reach out to her and learn more about the work she's leading in Palm Springs, California. And oh, well, I didn't know about Palm Springs, but I know here in San Francisco. Um, yes. and, and, OK, so are you a part of that? Like, do you consult? Are you come, are you here in the Bay Area helping with that process? How does that Look I've been you. to the I've been to the Bay Area several times, both okay. to San Francisco and to Oakland, uh -huh. and I, I am privileged to be able to work with um, Dr. and Director Cheryl Davis, who is the director of the Human Rights Commission for the City of San Francisco and the Reparations Task Force there. Um, so we collaborate, we share best practices. Evanston really kicked off localizing reparations in the yep. way that we're seeing it practiced today. And so I wouldn't call myself a consultant, but I do have um, at this point still singular experience in advancing, implementing, funding, and we are dispersing reparations. So we're beyond the study, we're beyond 
looking for ways to fund it. We are giving out checks here and other forms of benefits for reparations. And so I'm able to work with San Francisco, Palm Springs, Sacramento, Los Angeles, the state of California is doing great work, um, including the incredible leader, Dr. Cheryl Grills, that uh, was on the California task force and, uh, and so, so many more all across the nation. So Detroit, Michigan, Grand Rapids is um, beginning to do its work on reparations, Kalamazoo and Michigan, all across the state of Illinois. Um, there are over a hundred localities now that have been inspired by what's been accomplished in Evanston and are taking their first steps. So we're in community together. We have uh, monthly strategy sessions with the movement and our allies. So even if you'd like to join in and observe and see how you might join the movement, um, they are every fourth Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for one hour. Um, we also have regional strategy sessions. So for your listeners that are in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. um, there is a West regional strategy session that is actually co-led by Director uh, and Dr. Cheryl Davis from the city of San Francisco. Okay. and attorney Ariva Martin that is in Palm Springs and Kelly Riva who is chief of staff for the mayor in um, Sacramento, California. So please do consider joining in. More information about that is at firstrepair.org. Okay, I will. I love that. And look at you, Robin. You're so modest. She's like, I wouldn't consider myself a consultant. Yes, you are. To experience something like that is a really big deal. And kind of just to tap back really quickly on, I forget the word you said about how it's in our DNA in terms of the trauma. But I think it's also in our DNA because a lot of Black women during slavery, we were out there in the fields and we kind of held the family up. Yeah. Um, and so I think that really shows it translate even in today's time for example, doing what you're doing. And so that's in us. So for all of our listeners, because our podcast is for us, by us, that we can do amazing things like this. I mean, look at what Robin did. And I'm going to be enlisting all the information she just dropped. I'll have it in the description to join in. I think I will be joining in on some of those meetings. Um, and so it is just, yes, yes. I love that. I love that. Melody, you look like you were getting ready to say something. I was. And so um, one of the things um, that I am most interested in is regarding um, the task force. So I know you said that there are several cities, right, that are starting that. So we have the San Francisco, but we're here in Oakland. And so, you know, in how does one um, begin to even uh, initiate a task force in mm. their city? Good question. Well, I love the question. It is a great question. Um, and it happens different from city to city. In our case in Evanston, um, I was bold, or some folks might say crazy enough to call the question and begin the work. But in a lot of cities, it's not a legislator. It's a community member, just like yourself, Melody, that decides reparations now in Oakland. And the way that you do it is um, you always have to identify a strong legislative leader, because at the end of the day, you'll need a council vote or an assembly vote, depending on um, where you're introducing it. And um, so you'll need a strong legislative leader and then you'll need to convene a body of stakeholders, and that's Black folks. Black folks need to inform every step of the process. The harm community must inform the process of reparations um, and prescribe what redress looks like. Um, so there's a lot of players that are involved. You need to identify that strong legislative leader. You need to identify a a strong legal mind because a legal framework will need to be developed as well as potentially a defense for lawsuits against reparations. And that happens because we're still in a white supremacist nation and, and they're going to fight. So you'll need that. You'll need a group of allies because um, we can't do it alone. We need our allies. We need white folks and everybody that's not black to also support reparations and advocate for it so that it passed these diverse city councils that are usually in most cities. Even predominantly black cities um, are having uh, white elected. It's not uncommon. Um, right. So you'll need that. And you'll need a case for reparations. And so we have a global black case for reparations uh, that we all know and understand. But you will need a hyper-local, Oakland-centered case for reparations. And so a historian, an academic partner might be the best place to get that case. What happened specifically in Oakland, above and beyond redlining, which was a federal policy that was enforced, mm -hmm. above and beyond slavery, because, you know, 
you know, it wasn't a slave state and maybe there was no history of slavery there. Maybe there was. Um, but what government policies from the city of Oakland were enforced um, that were harmful to the black community and what practices, what incidents? In the case of Tulsa, Oklahoma, we're looking at the massacre that happened there, the race massacre, where there were many different bodies, insurance companies and the government and police departments and businesses, different industries and so on. So you'll need that case for reparations. It's a big lift. It's a huge body of work. It's an all hands on deck situation. You can't do it by yourself. Collaboration is key to get this done. And so that's why we've put together these strategy sessions so we can all get together, swap best practices, you know, vent and cuss and cry on each other's shoulders and love on each other so that we're ready to get back in the field, check on each other when we need a rest, you know, because the work is taxing. Mm. Um, and so that's really the purpose of these strategy sessions um, so that you can stay focused also because it's so much harm and you your head starts spinning. The more yeah. you learn about the case for reparations, the more you know and understand how deep and broad it is and how every institution is responsible and so on. Um, so the way you do reparations is you start because it's a long road ahead. It's multi-generational work. Your children and their children will still be fighting for the Black experience and Black justice. Unfortunately, it will take that much time for us to get to justice. Um, but that's how you do it. You get started. Yeah. I love yeah. it. <laughs> you know, that anybody can be a change agent, as you guys hear um, Ms. Yep. Robin sharing with us. And a lot of times, I think, you know, just for your regular folk, we get intimidated about politics and feeling like, can we, you know, um, implement change? And like you said, it takes a village. And so if someone wants to do this, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, resources and information out there to get a team started. But like she said, it's going to take a lot of work. So you got to be committed to the process, right, Robin? Um, That's and right. one last question that I have. So for someone, as I listen to the, you know, um, who would get reparations? Say you were born in one city state, moved along, your family, um, you know, roots are in one place. How do you guys determine where would you even get reparations from in situations like that? Well, everything starts with the harm report. So once you determine what the harm is, it's going to inform who's eligible, what's the form of redress, and all of that. In our case, the harm was a specific policy implemented uh, between 1919 and 1969. So everybody Black in Evanston during that time that was an adult and their direct descendants are eligible for reparations. Oh, now, thanks. it's going to be different from city to city. What we're finding, they're coming up with their own, the task force are coming up with their own eligibility requirements. But one thing that we found is consistent is that there's some sort form of uh, sort of legacy attachment to the city where there's some um, long history um, of being in that city. And what's unfortunate is everybody Black in town uh, deserves reparations, mm -hmm. but what body has the purview? So if you can only prove a harm between a period of time and you weren't there yet, um, then it's gonna be challenging. And so that's why all of us doing this local reparations, the great work that's happening in the state of California, the great work that's happening in San Francisco and all across the nation, our North Star remains a federal response to reparations, HR 40 passing so that we can get a federal bill because it will take the federal government and the capacity that it has to um, legislate and the budget capacity that it has to actually get us to full repair. And so we, we know and understand that a federal response is necessary, um, but it doesn't negate the fact that localities that also had anti-Black practices should be doing their part within their purview as well. And I just want to say this because I know that you're getting ready to wrap up the call. <laughs> the Bay Area, if you are looking to implement reparations to support it, there is an incredible group of strong, powerful, bad women in the Bay Area, all throughout California, that um, are very experienced. They have all types of different backgrounds, um, legal backgrounds and professional and academics and creatives and so on. There is so much leadership in California um, that you will have no shortage of opportunity 
to tap into the reparations movement with the leaders that are right there. Right on. Y'all hear it. Y'all hear it. We right here. So if you want to do it, she's letting you know it can be done. And so, yes, we are getting ready to wrap up the call, but I just wanted to um, comment on two things that you said, that you said that there's a lot of contributing factors to the harm done to Black people. And one of them specifically is in the academia. Um, for a lot of our listeners that don't know, um, slaves pretty much built some of the Ivy League schools like Harvard, Princeton, Yale things, schools that actually don't even want to admit um, Black people um, into the schools. And so for me, when we talk about reparations, yes, it can be a cash check, but it also can be around education because once you know something, no one can take it away from you. Um, and then my second statement is um, speeding up to 2024. How do you see that the reparations have helped the community? Do you see that the community is beginning to thrive a little bit more? I did see um, an elderly lady on there. She took the reparations. She um, received home repairs. And it just mm -hmm. made me think about my grandmother. She passed away in 2021. Um, but I would have loved for her to have received such um, an award to get her home repaired because um, that's much, much needed for um, you know, just for a person to be able to thrive, to have clean water, to have good flooring in their home, um, to not have leaky faucets. And so my question to you is, with this being a rolled out and it's happening in real time, how have you seen the community in Evanston thrive? Well, I'll tell you that there's been so much value add. I, I will not say that we've closed the racial wealth gap. That won't happen with any municipality or no state. It is impossible. Right. It will take a federal response for reparations and it'll take all layers of government. But what it has done, it has made our black community feel hope, feel seen, have voice, get back into their city where we had an exodus. And that is one of the reasons why I call the question of reparations. Black folks were leaving Evanston. They didn't feel any hope. We couldn't afford housing, mm. didn't feel a sense of place, weren't feeling represented and so on. And so now we have black families that are even returning back to Evanston just because we have committed to reparations. Wow. We have black leaders that are applying for leadership roles in Evanston because they believe it is a city that is ready to uh, grapple with repair and is doing it in a real and tangible way. We have institutions in town that now have layered in reparations as one of its core values for one of our foundations, uh, the Evanston Community Foundation, is an example. We have an interfaith community that reparations wasn't on their mind. Black folks experience wasn't on their mind. They did a coat drive once a year and thought that was enough. But now they are some of the strongest and boldest advocates for reparations. It's, it's oh. cold here, so we appreciate them coat. Don't keep right. the coats coming too, but, <laughs> but to keep the check coming too. And so my That's point right. is that we now have ally leaders, uh, synagogues and Catholic churches mm. and all denominations of faith that are not black, that boldly uh, advocate for reparations and showed us how much they meant by in a matter of about five months, raising $1 million to be a companion oh. to the work that's happening at the city level and put it in the hands of black leadership. And it will forever be in the hands of black leadership and that fundraising effort um, continues. There is a study that was done by Professor, Professor Al Tillery at Northwestern University um, that studied, or it was a survey that surveyed the community on what's the sentiment of reparations. We know that we didn't close a wealth gap, but what's the sentiment? Hearts and minds have been changed. Mm. Every community in town has more faith and belief in government than it did before we implemented reparations. Mm. Uh, we also have 70% of white folks, now that we've ripped the Band-Aid off and we are implementing reparations, we've shown that it's not going to create a race riot and everything's going to be OK, support reparations as public policy. Um, and all other communities um, support it as well. Of course, the Black community does. But we are seeing um, incredible value add, and we hope that more and more localities will do this work. And ultimately, um, the United States Congress will pass a initiative to begin the process of repair. 
And there we have it. See, when, when <laughs> Black people thrive, we all thrive. And That's what right. do we do? You know it's coming. What do we do here on the Invisible Women podcast? We, what? <laughs> we reclaim our time. What? We yes. reclaim yes. our power, power. And we reclaim our confidence, baby. And that is yes. what we did today with Robin Simmons. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You. Amazing, keep up the great work. And I will be dropping all those links that she mentioned because I know I have a feeling that you're, you're gonna have some people motivated to wanna make some changes in their area, wherever they're at, whether they're in the Bay Area, wherever they're in Muskegon, they might be in LA somewhere. Um, they might want to follow your lead and, and uh, move forward with change. So thank you so much. And we support thank you, you ladies. here at the podcast. Thank you, Robin. Have a good <laughs> thank one. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.